Welcome to History of Christian Worship Practices from Nebraska Christian College. This is the first lecture. As we go through this course, we will be discussing the main forms of worship as found in Scripture and carried out through the church up to current day. Christmas was four weeks ago. More than any other time of year, Christmas is filled with traditions. Some are big, some are little. Some have been passed down for generations, and some start when the next generation arrives. Some traditions are silly and fun, like the ugly Christmas sweater. When I was growing up, my brothers and I would always go to the Waffle House after Christmas Eve services, and it became a tradition for us. Now we have Chinese food, and we take it out, and we watch the Christmas story on uh, TV, and we wrap presents on Christmas Eve. There's also other crazy traditions like decorating your house with an enormous amount of lights or even your car. And there are Christmas concerts like the one we have at Nebraska Christian College with Colors of Christmas. In college, my buddies and I would always go on Thanksgiving break and we would play cards together, a uh, little nickel-dime quarter poker. So Thanksgiving is another time for... Holidays are a great time to talk about traditions because they're a time that we do things that we don't do throughout the rest of the year. Um, we sing songs, we decorate our houses, we go to special parties, we um, wear special clothes... It's not just holidays that we celebrate and experience ritual and tradition. Um, when I was in college, I was in a fraternity, and we had a lot of ritual. We had a lot of symbolic uh, ceremonies and things that would help us to remember and grow as a brotherhood and grow as men and leaders. Um, one of them in particular was called the stair jump. In the stair jump, all the new initiated brothers were standing up at the top of the flight of stairs. Actually, we were in a room, um, isolated, and one at a time, uh, a brother would come and get one of us and tell us to do whatever the brotherhood was yelling at us to do, which sounds a bit threatening and scary, but it was actually really fun. Because when we got to the top of the stairs, we would just hear the words, jump, jump, jump being chanted by the crowd of brothers at the bottom. So we would run down these three flights of stairs and we would jump from as far up on the last level of stairs as we could and be caught by this crowd of brothers. And then they would start throwing us up in the air and they would chant the fraternity chant and they would try to hit the chandelier that was at the roof of the foyer. And it was just a great, fun, symbolic way of saying, you've joined the brotherhood. We won't let you down. We won't drop you. We won't forget about you. You can trust your brothers. So tradition is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation or the fact of being passed along this way. So it's a tradition that we do it this way. And we do this tradition this way. A ritual, though, is a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. So a ritual is a way to express something and do something symbolically, intentionally, that has a deeper meaning, and it's usually religious or solemn in nature. Uh, ritual is, is a type of tradition, but not all traditions are rituals. Traditions, especially in meaningful contexts, started in order to communicate deeper truth or remember a significant event. The reality is people want to find something that they can count on, and there's a leaning backward. There's a reach back towards that tradition to remember and to find meaning because today is so fast-paced and it feels like we do not even have any traditions and in the supersized drive through instant gratification, digital download culture, our needs are met so quickly. There's no time for substance or meaning. There's no room for intentionality or depth. There's no room for mystery or wonder. Everything is surface layer. And that can happen in our church worship culture as well. In a seemingly rootless 
religious culture, there's a growing interest in connecting to our roots once again. And while many still think there's a worship war going on between hymn folk and modern worship folk, there's actually a movement of greater substance going against today's evangelical non-liturgical services. The movement has been called by some neo-liturgical. Some bands and worship folks at the front of this movement uh, are Aaron Equist, Stephen Proctor in, in the visual worship realm, Glenn Packham, who's from Desperation Band and New Life in Colorado Springs. They're blurring the lines between evangelical and mainline, liturgical, fundamental, and contemporary. You can go to Aaron Equist's website, anewliturgy.com, and find all sorts of liturgical studies and practices and experiences and expressions. There's an article in Christianity Today that you can look up. It's from 2008, but it is still worth reading. Um, One of the quotes from this says, The sons and daughters of modernity are rediscovering the joy and the neglected beauty of classical Christian teaching. It is a moment of joy of beholding anew what had been nearly forgotten, of hugging a lost child. People are going back to the ancient writings of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century. They're going back to studying um, spiritual formation practices. Glenn Packham and glennpackham.com has great um, books and understanding about how we worship and how our faith has been shaped by our worship and how our faith should be shaped by the history of our worship as well. The reality is all of our religion has tradition. All of our churches have a history. Think of Restore Community Church. It launched January 11th, 2015. It was planted by Calvary Church in Bellevue, First Christian in Council Bluffs, and One Life in Plattsmouth. It's over 10 years old, or One Life is over 10 years old. Calvary is over 40, and First Christian is almost 125 years old. And Restore is now five years old and being launched once again, relaunched. But its past is rooted not just in its own history and legacy and rituals, but in the history of all the churches that have helped to support it. And Restore's future will in some form or another be related to the past. Where are we going The question to ask is, what remains from what has gone before? What from yesterday influences today? Do you celebrate communion weekly? Why do you? Does the preacher deliver the sermon from a pulpit? How is the leadership structured? Do you celebrate Advent season? What about Pentecost Sunday? What about Epiphany? Do you collect an offering? Do you have stained glass windows? Do you project images of stained glass windows? On screens why do you do what you do or why do you not do what you do while other churches do it whether we are going way back and looking at ancient religious practices or starting from scratch creating new experiences we want to see our congregational worship as something bigger it is bigger than what we simply do on an isolated Sunday morning in a small church somewhere in America It's more than five songs and a sermon. It's more than chairs or pews or a parking lot. What other worship forms were used down through history, and can those forms give us our current forms more meeting? The purpose of this class is to rediscover the worship forms of the past millennia and find fresh ways to enrich our current worship experiences. Maybe we can establish some meaningful traditions in our churches that will help them connect with God in significant ways. In this course, we will be discussing worship forms. Worship forms are conventions and components of the community that express unique devotion to God. So obviously music and prayer are major components of our worship, but also where we gather, how and when we gather, and other components as well. So when we talk about worship forms, This is the list we'll be discussing. So the worship forms found in your text and in our conversations will be divided up into these nine categories. The first two are the two sacraments that Jesus specifically 
um, encountered or spoke on, and they are the two most uh, recognized components of Christianity, and they have been adapted in some way to every different denomination and Christian heritage, with exception. Um, baptism and initiation, how people join the church, how they are physically set apart for uh, the body of believers. Eucharist or communion or the Lord's Supper, how we celebrate and remember Christ's death on the cross and the atonement and the sacrifice and all of the theology that comes into that, uh, that practice. We'll also talk about prayer um, how and when people prayed, who prayed, the types of prayers. We'll talk about Christian time, the, lit- the liturgical calendar, the weekly schedule and rhythm of the church, and as well as seasonal holy days festivals. We'll look at pastoral rites. Um, the white text actually discusses these four subcomponents reconciliation with the church. Healing, the practice of healing in the church, marriage, and the wedding um, festivals and practices, and also death and burial practices. Another worship form is leadership. What is the leadership structure of the church? How does this change and evolve over the centuries? Preaching also is one that we'll look at uh, in a specific manner, how that evolves and changes throughout the different eras of church history and obviously music is a major component of our worship form and architecture as well how the buildings changed how the interior of our worship spaces changed and when and where we would worship um, because of those components so this was a brief introduction of the course Uh, the next lecture will be discussing Old Testament worship and the initial worship forms as they developed from Jewish culture into early Christianity.